Okay, let's have a closer look at some of the properties of ionic and molecular compounds. First off, to just to refresh your memory, for ionic compounds, remember, they are made of a positive uh, cation combined with a negative anion, which means that they're basically a, a combination of a metal, right, which is going to be positively charged, and a non-metal, which is going to be negatively charged. Uh, sometimes the, the cation can be something like ammonia. Uh, the anion is negative and it's a non-metal, or it could be one of those polyatomic ions that you see on your polyatomic chart. Molecular compounds, by contrast, are made of combinations of two or more non-metals. That means to say, on your periodic table, they come from the right-hand side. This is where the non-metals are on your periodic table. Uh, they're made of two or more combinations of those, and they bond by sharing their covalent, or their outer, electrons to get their magic number of eight. If we look at some of the properties of ionic compounds, we can list them off here. Uh, they tend to have a very high melting point. So therefore, almost all ionic compounds are solids at room temperatures. And it takes a lot of energy to liquefy them or to melt them. They typically will form a crystal shape. Um, they will line up in a definite crystalline shape. So if, for example, salt. They're soluble in water to some extent. Now, some are poorer to dissolve in water, but some are quite good. And the reason for doing this is because water itself is a, is a polar molecule. That is to say, it has a positive and a negative end to it. And so they can dissolve ions quite nicely because ions are either positive or negative. If you look, for example, at this diagram here, you can see a sodium ion here with his positive charge and a chlorine ion here. So this is table salt dissolved in water uh, and the chlorine has a negative charge. Now water is rather interesting in that one side of the water molecule has a negative charge and the other side has a positive charge. So where the oxygen is it's negatively charged. So notice that around the sodium the water molecules are all pointing this way towards the, the sodium with their negative end to attract to his positives, whereas with the chlorine, they, they flip around. And so that now you see the positive ends of the water molecule attracting to the chlorine. Now, because you have these positive or negative charges dissolved in water, you then can create what's called an electrolyte. So if you look at this diagram here, you can see that inside this water, we must have a solution of something like, say, salt. And it's allowing uh, electrons to transfer from one electrode, negative electrons from one electrode to the other, which is causing this light bulb to light up. Uh, one of the problems with ionic compounds is how soluble are they? Some will dissolve better than others. If they do dissolve in water, we place the symbol AQ for aqueous solution after them. If they will not dissolve, we place an S, which means they're a solid. And that means that when you mix them together, they're going to form a precipitate. The solids will simply fall to the bottom and collect on the bottom of the tube. They won't dissolve. Well, to figure this out, you have in your data booklet a, the solubility chart on one of your pages that lists all these ions, and you can then try to make sense of whether they'll dissolve. So if we look at this first one here, we've got uh, ammonium sulfide. And so our question is, is, well, will that dissolve? Well, I can find the ammonium ion right there. And it says, you know, he's soluble with just about everybody. There's a few exceptions down here, but it doesn't look like sulf, uh, sulfur is one of the exceptions. So this guy deserves to get an AQ. It will dissolve in water. What about um, silver chloride? Well, here's the chloride ion listed up on top here. And now let's go down below. It's soluble with just about everybody, but looky here. He's not soluble with silver. So silver chloride is going to be a, a solid. You could mix that with water. It'll fall to the bottom. It won't mix up. What about lead sulfate? Well, I locate the sulfate ion here. And then I look below and say it's, it's soluble with just about everybody. But there is an exception. And look at that. Lead is one of them. So this guy is also going to be a solid. It won't dissolve. How about strontium hydroxide? This one here. Here's the hydroxide ion. And if I look down, it says he's soluble with everybody in group number one. Well, strontium is not in group number one. Strontium would be down here with these guys, so this is going to be a solid. What about iron hydroxide? Well, once again, I go over and I locate where the hydroxide is, which is right here again. And he says he's soluble with just about everybody, but um, uh, anybody in group one and, and, and ammonia, he's insoluble with anybody else. So that guy's going to be a solid. 
Now we'll use some names here instead of some formulas. Potassium carbonate, here is where the carbonate is located. And it says that uh, carbonate is soluble with anybody in group 1. See where it says group 1 there? Well, potassium is in group 1, so that'll be dissolvable. That's AQ. Iron 2 nitrate. Here's nitrate located way over here. Nitrate is soluble with everybody, pretty much, except for these three exceptions down here. But that doesn't include iron, so that'll dissolve. Matter of fact, almost all nitrates are dissolvable. Copper 1 chloride. Now, where's chlorine? Here it is up here again. And he's soluble with just about everybody. However, copper 1, copper with that 1 plus charge, that's an exception. This one will be solid then. He won't dissolve. Barium hydroxide. Here's the hydroxide one more time. And it says he's soluble with anybody in group number 1. Yeah, well, barium is in group number 2 if you look on your periodic table. And so this one won't work. It won't dissolve. Ammonium sulfate. Now, if I have a look at this one, I've got sulfate located right here. Sulfate says he's soluble with everybody. Some exceptions are calcium, strontium, barium, but I don't see ammonium, so therefore this one will dissolve. So it's not a guessing game. You look on your data table and you find out whether or not the combination dissolves. Water, as I mentioned earlier, is rather interesting. It's, it's a polar molecule. If you look at the uh, arrangement of water here with oxygen and hydrogen, the oxygen is essentially a little bit negative, whereas the hydrogens are a little bit positive. So if you draw a line right through the molecule, cutting it in half, the one half is positive overall, and the other half is negative. Well, when we have that situation, we say that you are polar. You've got a positive end and a negative end, kind of like a battery. For this reason, water is attracted to itself, and it's also attracted to anybody else who's either positive or negative. It doesn't really care. He's got both a positive end and a negative end. He'll attract anyway. Water does some interesting things. When it, uh, when it gets cold, it forms a nice structure, forms a very nice crystalline structure, and it expands a little bit because this arrangement takes up a bit more room than liquid water, and that's why you get patterns like snowflakes that have these six points on them. Um, not four like you cut out on paper back in kindergarten. Snowflakes actually have six points on them. And of course, because this is caused by random combinations of water molecules joining up in a nice structure, you'll never get any two snowflakes that are exactly the same.